Oral questions by members. Member for Richmond, Queensboro. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Minister of Education finally promised to unveil a schooling plan on July 29th. So imagine my surprise when, as a parent, I received a request from the ministry to complete a survey on what school might look like in the fall. And the deadline for filling out the ministry's consultation, July 31st. So this doesn't add up, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister of Education tell parents why their input won't be included in the government's plan? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for the question. Um, the effort that government is uh, undertaking right now to restart education in September is based on the successful plan that we had in June. We were the only jurisdiction to reopen all of our schools in North America. I think that's a testament to the 70,000 people who work in the education system. Uh, we had uh, a health and safety protocol that is now being emulated by jurisdictions around this continent and indeed internationally. And uh, all of that effort, and it was a tremendous, tremendous effort, six to eight weeks of planning, uh, paid huge dividends to uh, the, the future direction that we're heading to. But we want to know what parents think of that experience. Obviously, there was a, a great level of uh, fear and uncertainty that is part of this pandemic. Some teacher, uh, some parents opted not to return their children to school. We made that voluntary. Uh, but 200,000 children did return to the school system. And we want to know the experiences of families that both utilized uh, in-class instruction that was returned in June, and of course, families that continued to uh, avail themselves of remote online learning activities. This is about getting better. This is about uh, noting the experiences of families in British Columbia to inform our plan. The steering committee I referenced earlier is composed of every stakeholder in the K-12 sector. The collaborative approach that we have in British Columbia has been key to our success in British Columbia, and I think that uh, other jurisdictions are very interested in how we were able to work with both teaching professionals, support staff unions, principals and vice principals, elected trustees, and move forward on a consensual basis uh, where we're all uh, working together, of course, under the scientific leadership of our very capable provincial Thank you, Minister. Office. Member Richmond, Queensboro. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The reality is parents are worried about what the fall looks like. I know as a parent I'm worried. Tens of thousands of British Columbians are worried because if they can't work, if they care, kids don't have school open, they can't work. It's about economic recovery as well. And the uncertainty and worries that parents have about childcare, about transportation, about going back to work are very real. Thousands and thousands of parents are being impacted. The minister, Mr. Speaker, is adding to that uncertainty. Originally, the minister said there would be no plan until August 20th. Under pressure last week from the opposition, he set a date of July 29th, but now his own survey says input will be accepted until the end of July. Will the minister confirm for the parents of British Columbia that a clear plan, one that sets out what's going to happen in September, will be released on July 29th? Minister of Education. Thank you. And again, to the member for the question, and I know that he probably reads the daily news, uh, the date around July uh, 29th uh, is now uh, public. Uh, we've, we've confirmed that. We have the steering committee in every part of the school system uh, working towards giving parents as much certainty as we can give, and we have to be frank here. Uh, we will uh, announce uh, what the plan looks like, what the updated health and safety protocols look like, and give uh, a substantive uh, release of the plan details uh, by the end of July. But we're always going to have to check that against how well British, British Columbia is, is performing in this pandemic. And, uh, and, and so it will be updated uh, throughout the summer. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, parent engagement that we're conducting, I'm very, very pleased that the very first week that the survey was uh, made available to parents around British Columbia, we had 10,000 surveys completed. So it is increasing by the day, by the thousands. This is very valuable input uh, for our people. <laughs> Richmond, yes. Fraser Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I've heard from a lot of parents and a lot of grandparents who just want straight answers so they can figure out what they're going to do in the fall. The minister says, and I quote, the goal is to have school instruction resume five days a week, end quote. 
But the head of the BC Teachers Federation, Terry Mooring, says, hold on a minute. Quote, right now, it is unlikely that we will be back to full-time instruction in schools. End quote. Parents just want an honest answer. To the Minister of Education, will there be full-time instruction in the classroom in September? Minister of Education. Minister, you're muted. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to the member uh, who poses the question, we're trying to uh, bring certainty. That's what the planning exercise is about. That's why the BC Te Teachers Federation is, is a component of the steering committee. Uh, we very clearly stated that that is our goal. That's the goal of many Canadian provinces and territories for September. Uh, British Columbians, uh, our province's chance of having all kids return to school in the fall is enhanced by how we all perform as a province, how we all take our responsibilities to be safe and, and, and uh, engage in activities that are safe and under the advice of Dr. Bonnie Henry and others for the duration of the summer. That's what the plan depends on. So we will share uh, the elements of the plan uh, when the steering committee has completed its work. I've uh, told the members that that will be made uh, publicly available uh, by the end of uh, July. Uh, the parent survey, just to correct the previous member, uh, is available, and I would encourage all MLAs to direct parents uh, towards this from their constituency office. Uh, will be online until July 24th, so that's an, still remains an important uh, avenue to uh, to receive feedback. Member Fraser Nicola on a supplemental. Well, let's be clear. These are questions that thousands of parents are asking. Am I going to have to find childcare? Am I going to have to work fewer hours and stay at home? Will my boss let me work from home? Will my kids be able to adapt? Will their mental health suffer? These are serious questions that families are asking, and the minister's refusal to provide straight answers is unacceptable. Will the minister commit today that the July 29th plan will answer the questions that parents have? Minister of Education. Well, uh, listen, if the, if the member has been listening to the conversation, has been participating in uh, the discussion that is going on within the school system, we have a very diverse school system, 60 school districts, independent schools around British Columbia. We're building our plan based on a success that only, only British Columbia jo enjoyed in June. And we will continue to, uh, to work on that for September. We want to give as much certainty as we can. That requires very careful planning. Safety is our number one priority for students and staff uh, and families. Uh, we know that education is critically important to the overall provincial effort in terms of restarting our economy. We're mindful of that. And uh, look, we're on track uh, as, a, as an outlier jurisdiction who has managed the pandemic well, has safely reopened schools, and is in, a, is in an excellent position to do so come September. And look, a lot of parents are very happy with what has happened in British Columbia. And let me quote one parent who says, uh, and he said this on radio, we've been very happy with what the public education system has provided, certainly for our son in our school district. That quote, the MLA for Richmond, Queensboro. Later, third party. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. COVID members posed existential threats to our society and our economy. Members, members if, if we may, we, we will want to make sure we give a good opportunity for the opposition to get in as many questions as possible. Leader, third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID-19 crisis exposed existential threats to our society and, of course, our economy. But as we plan our recovery from COVID-19, we remain extremely vulnerable to the economic and social crisis that can be brought on by a degrading climate. A few months ago, this government delayed indefinitely the next scheduled increase to the price of carbon. In the current economic context, this may be seen as a tough question, but it is now more than ever that we need to talk about the price signals that we uh, will use to shape our recovery. Economists agree that consistent scheduled increases to the price of carbon 
is essential to its effectiveness as a tool. When the government remains consistent in our policy to raise the incentive to decarbonize and innovate, it provides businesses with the certainty that they need to plan for their investments in moving to a clean economy. We need a clean recovery, and if we don't continue with progressive carbon pricing, we risk destroying the progress that we've created thus far and entering into a more carbon-intensive recovery. My question through you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Minister of Finance. Will she provide the right signal for a clean recovery by telling us when her government will restore the scheduled carbon tax increase? Minister of Finance. We seem to have a technical glitch. Minister of Finance. Perhaps we could come back. Minister of the Environment. Thank you uh, very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, British Columbia has uh, the most robust uh, carbon tax in North America. We have provided predictability to British Columbians and to industry by laying out in advance a schedule that maintains that leadership and that shows where we're going. But we also know that uh, the carbon tax is not the only tool necessary to make uh, advances in the face of the climate crisis. We have uh, increased the climate action credit for uh, British Columbians to help families uh, deal with the costs and make the changes. We also have the Clean BC Industrial Incentive Program to do the same thing. Uh, we also have a suite of regulations and we're investing well over a billion dollars over a four-year period to fight climate change. But Honourable Speaker, the member's right. We faced in March a COVID crisis. It doesn't mean we turn away from our commitment to climate action. If anything, uh, it's inspired us to double down and ensure that Clean BC and climate action will be at the heart of our economic recovery. But I don't believe uh, that it's responsible government in the face of an immediate crisis that affected every business and every person in every corner of British Columbia to move ahead without thinking about the impacts of not making an adjustment to our plan. We deferred uh, the, the increase in the carbon tax for review by September 30th. That review will take place. It will take place in the context of our economic recovery plans, as well as the state of COVID. We recognize the climate emergency. We also recognize the COVID crisis. We believe it's possible to address both at the same time. That's exactly what we intend to do. Leader, third party on a supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the, uh, to the minister for the very thorough answer and uh, for, uh, for, for, for the answer. Sectoral targets, uh, as enabled by last year's Climate Change Accountability Amendment Act, need to be set by March 2021. This is also an important tool. It assists industry and the public identify where emissions originate, what policies are working, and those that aren't. Transparent data-driven sectoral targets can assist us in balancing our current emission rates and reductions that are necessary to meet our legislated targets. As we work to recover from a badly damaged economy with both an immediate and a long view, establishing sectoral targets will help us achieve the prosperous and clean future that British Columbians want. Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy has the minister asked his staff to use sectoral targets to ensure that our recovery strategy is in line with the emission reductions that we need to achieve clean BC? Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you again to the member. Uh, we're very proud of the work we've done to create the, uh, the clean BC plan, and part of that was creating uh, changes to the Climate Change Accountability Act, uh, the interim emissions target, as well as the establishment and legislation of the responsibility to create sectoral targets. Uh, we did that in consultation with the Green Caucus, as the member well knows. We also consulted uh, quite broadly in the uh, creation of that new legislation. Uh, we are working hard to uh, do the engagement necessary with environmental organizations, with industry, with British Columbians, with municipalities, with Indigenous people to ensure 
that we get the targets right and that we do it in a way that they can achieve their purpose. And their purpose is to provide certainty, to provide guideposts along the way to meeting our legislated targets, uh, to provide a roadmap to get there. Uh, we have much engagement left to do, but we are on target to uh, be setting those uh, targets as required by legislation. We also are working very, very hard on ensuring that we have a, a broad-based set of recommendations for cabinet consideration for specific items in our economic recovery plans that will provide jobs, that will provide equity, that will lift up uh, communities and Indigenous people, that will support uh, the economy of British Columbia and move us further along the pathway to meeting our emission reduction targets and entrenching Clean BC uh, in the future of British Columbians. Member Kamloops, South Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, communities across uh, British Columbia are experiencing what uh, the Housing Minister referred to quite dismissively yesterday as, quote, a bit of an unsettled time, end quote. Uh, this is what uh, Carolyn and, and Paul Barry, uh, owners of Spoke Bike and Ski, had to say about the rapidly deteriorating situation on Victoria uh, Street West in Kamloops, and I quote, we are subject to break-ins, vandalism, theft, and unlawful use of our private property daily. We have had our phone lines cut. We had an attempted break-in through the back of our building. We've had a break-in through the roof of our building. Fires started in trailers beside our building. Our staff feel threatened. Our customers are being affected, as well as the constant cleanup. This is the reality of Victoria Street West, end quote. Uh, Mr. Speaker, these are real issues that uh, are undeserving of being associated with a, a, a characterization by the minister as being a bit of an unsettled time. So to the housing minister, uh, when will she provide the 24-7 on-site wraparound services that our most vulnerable population needs and that all of these communities are calling out for? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I can appreciate the member uh, you know, um, talking about some of the challenges that, uh, that they left behind because they didn't do the kind of supportive housing that is desperately needed. And what they're demonstrating is just how much more work there is to do, Honourable Speaker. There's still absolutely lots of work to do because you can't fix 16 years of bad in three years, Mr. Speaker. It's just impossible. But we've certainly made a good start. And I want to point out, Honourable Speaker, that, that yesterday I, I read into the record a job description, a job posting, for what it, what it takes, the professional expertise it takes to be a supportive uh, worker that, that is available 24-7. But let me read into the record and for the member, I want to make sure that the member understands exactly what other kind of resources are absolutely available for these, uh, for these people who have been neglected, Honourable Speaker, been neglected for uh, well over a decade by the previous government. So um, uh, Dr. Ann Yen, uh, who works with the Kool-Aid Community Health Services uh, outreach team here in Victoria, this is what she had to say recently on CBC Radio around the supports uh, that they bring, uh, her team brings to those who are homeless. She says, it is a team of 20 some odd doctors who work in about four full-time positions, working with nurses and a social worker, delivering health services in these five motels, the ones that are here in Victoria, Honourable Chair, and at the Save On Food Arenas. This is the other thing she says, Honourable Chair. She says there's been a fair bit of stabilization that has occurred in the last few months, so people are accessing health services, including addictions care, mental health care services, and some primary care. And what she also says is that what she's hearing is that housing works. Housing first works, and that we need more of it, Honourable Chair. Member Campbell, so Thompson on a supplemental. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Newsflash for the minister opposite. This is uh, a three years uh, into their mandate. They're responsible for ensuring that the services are there to help people get better. They're responsible for ensuring that there are roofs over, the, uh, over people's heads. They're responsible for re responding to small businesses in communities across this province, which are constantly getting broken into. They're responsible for the fact that, that people in their own neighbourhoods are terrified to walk out of their, out of their doors. And this is happening everywhere. <laughs> So simply moving uh, 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 folks into temporary housing uh, while not ensuring that the, that the clinicians are actually on site is not going to help the, the vulnerable uh, population get any better. Uh, Nina and Mindy of Sisters Sleep Gallery had this to say, and I quote, 
Every night, our families at home worry for our safety and well-being. The question in their minds always is, will they make it home safely at the end of the day? And quote. Clearly, more resources are needed to help people get better. Uh, yet the minister says, while uh, there may be, uh, not be cl clinicians on site, there is, uh, there's always someone to have a cup of tea with. Not good enough uh, to, to the minister uh, across the way. So the question again is this, uh, when is the minister going to ensure that the 24-7 on-site wraparound services and supports which this government talks about so often are actually in place for the people who need those supports? Absolutely. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Uh, let's be clear about the choice here. These people are already part of our communities. There are mothers and our sisters, there are fathers and our brothers, and they were, frankly, Honourable Speaker, they were ignored for a long time. They were neglected. We're choosing to care for them. We're choosing to put them in homes. We're choosing to make sure that they have the supports that they need. They can live on the streets, Honourable Speaker, with, with, without supports, or they can live in a home with supports. And if it was up to the opposition, they would still be on the streets. Let's be really clear. So while we're working to tackle some very big challenges, Honourable Speaker, no one is saying these aren't big challenges. They are absolutely big challenges. We're working with people and we're working with communities. The opposition instead, Honourable Speaker, is driving their resources to drive division. They want to see division, Honourable Speaker, and you know why? They wanted to see division because they want to score cheap political points rather than working together to make sure that these people are, are supported and are housed and can be integrated into the community. Members, Member Vancouver Falls Creek. Yes, overdose deaths are at an all-time high, and the uh, homelessness count earlier this year indicated that homelessness is going up. The minister claims that she is caring for people, that they have wraparound supports already in place from the people that she has moved into residential neighbourhoods. That is not what residents say. Uh, Rosie writes, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. Jennifer writes, we feel helpless and captive. Thomas writes, no one should feel unsafe in their own neighbourhood. To the Minister of Housing, when will she provide the care and the wraparound services so residents so need feel safe again in their own communities? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thank you very much, um, Honourable Chair. And like I said, we inherited a crisis from the old government. We've been working diligently for three years, but like I said, you can't fix 16 years of bad, 16 years of neglect in three. We're going to keep doing that work, Honourable Chair. But let me tell you a story about Deborah and about how Deborah made use of the supports and services that were available to her. She moved into modular housing uh, on June of, of 2018. And by Christmas, Deborah was talking about getting sober and moving forward with her life, Honourable Chair. She transitioned from her home to a detox program in January 2019, and then she, went, she made the choice to go into, into treatment, Honourable Chair, in March 2019. And by fall, by fall, she had moved to a sober living facility and started to apply for jobs. Now, Deborah, Honourable Chair, because of the supports and the services and the homes that, that, that she had available to her, Deborah has 18 months sober and a full-time job. And not only that, Honourable Chair, she reports that she has her driver's license back and she's been able to purchase a motor vehicle. Member Vancouver Falls Creek on a supplemental. After three years of this government, overdose deaths are at an all-time high and homelessness is going up. How many more years of this government can vulnerable people afford? My constituent, Barb, forwarded a note from a 20-year neighbour, Wes. I never thought it would come to this. We visit the park daily with our two young children. We have to scan the area and watch them ultra closely. We fear for the children. We have posted our home for sale. My constituent, Luke, believes the plan is, quote, to wait until the community stops screaming about the disaster unfolding on our nearby streets. To the Minister of Housing, when will she address the legitimate concerns of my constituents. Minister Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for 
Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. Um, the member is raising several different issues, all of them very, very challenging ones. I'm sure there's not a person in this House whose heart is not broken at the fact that overdose deaths are now going up again in our province. Um, we know that last year, as a result of the enormous investments of our province uh, from our government and the thousands of people working on the front lines of the overdose crisis, that the death toll was going down. But, Honourable Speaker, as the member knows very well and as the coroner has been crystal clear about, because of COVID-19, because of the disruption in the illicit drug supply, the drugs on the street are no, now more toxic than ever before, and that's the main factor that means the death toll has gone up. So, Honourable Speaker, we are, we have, from, from day one, as a government, we've been tackling the overdose crisis on many fronts, uh, on housing, because social determinants of mental health and addictions are very important, on the poverty front, with a new Minister of Poverty Reduction who's taken bold action, and in our government, we are working overtime. We are working every single day to escalate our response to the overdose crisis. Just this week, Honourable Speaker, we made some new announcements uh, so that we have more tools in the toolbox new uh, substance use integrated teams, honourable speaker, because we know that four, or four out of five people who are overdosing have had a connection with the healthcare system in the last year, and we want to keep them connected with healthcare, with the supports they need, with the counselling, with treatment, and we've also just announced 50 to 70 new beds, honourable speaker. We are working across the entire continuum of care, from harm reduction to treatment and recovery, um, to prevention, and honourable speaker, it would serve the people of this province well, it would serve the people at risk of overdose much better if we took the same approach to addressing these issues as we did on COVID-19, which means people on both sides of this house coming together with the people of the province, all hands on deck, let's show the same compassion and kindness and boldness and innovation as we did on the overdose crisis as we have on COVID-19. Member, members, member, North Vancouver Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know that the overdose deaths have been going up because this province, after three years of a separate ministry, has failed to put forward a proper mental health and addictions plan that will actually help these people. The fact is, is that overdoses, total overdoses, non-fatal overdoses, have consistently gone up under the NDP's watch. Fabian writes, this is a, a constituent in downtown Vancouver today. He wrote, I live beside the Howard Johnson Hotel. There is an increase of disruption, open drug use, and people camping and defecating around the apartment building I live in. This is not sustainable. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? This is happening all over the province under the NDP's watch. This is in downtown Vancouver, and even the NDP mayor of Vancouver has said the homelessness crisis and the addiction crisis is worse under this government than ever before. So my question is to the minister who is dismissing this. What are you going to do about the people that are dying on the streets as well as the people that are not getting the supports that they need in these hotels? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Honourable Speaker, I think it's really unfortunate that the opposition chooses to play partisan games with an issue as serious as this. Honourable Speaker, these are the people who are dying. Some of them live on the street. Some of them have well-paying jobs. One out of four live in construction, work in construction or trades. Members, the, min members, members, the minister has the floor. Thank you. Honourable Speaker, when I was first appointed to this job and I attended a recovery conference in New Westminster, Somebody in the recovery community said to me, Minister, you must feel as if 
you're driving a badly damaged airplane through a Category 5 hurricane. And what he meant by that, Honourable Speaker, was that that side of the House left behind a total mess when it came to the system of Neville Health and Addictions. So, Honourable Speaker, Honourable Speaker, if the members want to hear the answer, I'm happy to continue. Members. Minister. Honourable Speaker, after 16 years of that side of the House ignoring the system for mental health and addictions care, we took bold and decisive action. We took action on the overdose crisis, and we've been taking action on the entire continuum of care, Honourable Speaker. Uh, let's talk about prevention for a minute. Let's talk about prevention, because I think our goal is to start early, to start with our kids, to, uh, to address small problems before they become big problems and before they turn to addiction. So I'm very, very proud that our government has expanded the Foundry Network, and we will have 19 Foundry Youth Centres in communities, urban and rural, right across British Columbia. And we're very proud of that, because that's about keeping our kids safe. And, Honourable Speaker, we have been investing, as I've said, across the board, from harm reduction to prevention to treatment and recovery. We have new risk mitigation guidelines. We have new treatment beds. We have more coming on stream soon. But it does not serve the interests of people at risk of overdose or the people of this province to pretend that those supports are not there and to deny that the cause of the spike in overdoses is a poisoned drug supply. That's the message we need to get out there to keep people safe across British Columbia. The bell ends question period.